Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the 11th talk of the 2024 Invited Seminar Series organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego Chapter. And today we are delighted to host Professor Nitin Sanket of Robotics Engineering Department at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. This talk is co-hosted by IEEE Robotics and Automation Society Chapter San Diego Section, IEEE Com Consumer Technology Society San Diego Chapter, IEEE Aerospace and Electronics Society San Diego Chapter, IEEE Computer Society Chapters of Pikes Peak, Santa Clara Valley, and San Antonio Sections. And as always, we have the Open Research Institute Incorporation as our media partner for the entire series. Most of our talks are recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, maintained by ORI, uh, for later viewing. Uh, now, uh, with that, I would like to introduce our today's speaker. Uh, we have uh, Professor Nitin Sanket, uh, you know, who is currently an assistant professor in robotics engineering and heads the Perception and Autonomous Robotics Group, PER, with affiliation to consumer science, to computer science and electronics and electrical and computer engineering departments at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. He received his master's in robotics uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, Grasp Lab, where he worked with Professor Costas Danielidis on developing a benchmark for indoor outdoor visual inertial odometry systems. He was an assistant clinical professor uh, in the first year innovation and research experience and a postdoctoral fellow in the perception and robotics group at the University of Maryland College Park. During this time, he worked with Professor Yanis Alaimonos and Dr. Cornelia Fermuller on developing bio-inspired AI frameworks uh, using the action perception synergy uh, for the resource constraint, uh, tiny, mobi uh, tiny mobile robots. His doctoral thesis won the Larry S. Davis Award and MDPI uh, Drones PhD thesis award. He is also a re recipient of the Dean's Fellowship, Future Faculty Fellowship, and G. Wiley Fellowship, and was the Maryland Robotics Center Student Ambassador. He has also taught courses, uh, including uh, hands-on aerial robotics and vision, planning and control in aerial robotics. Dr. Sanket is currently an associate editor for the Nature NPG Robotics and IEEE Robotics and Automation Letter uh, Journals. He is also a reviewer for, for uh, Science Robotics, RAL, TASE, uh, IMAVIS, CPPR, ACRA, RSS, IROS, SIGGRAPH, and many, many other top journals and conferences. His work has been featured in a wide range of mass media, including the uh, cover of Science Robotics, BBC Earth, Voice of America, IEEE Spectrum, Mash Mashable, and Tech Explore, uh, to name a few. I should also mention that during his free time, Professor Sanket is also an award-winning photographer with his photographs featured in National Geographic's uh, favorite, uh, National Geographic's favorites, amongst others. Uh, today, we are pleased to have Professor Sanket to give us his talk from uh, to give us his talk titled "From Mystery to Mastery: Tiny Robot Autonomy Using Manifestation of the Unknown." So, without further ado, Dr. Nitin, the, pro the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for that warm introduction. Uh, I hope you can still see my screen. If any of the videos don't play properly, please let me know uh, because I wouldn't know. Um, okay. So I just like, I tried to make it interactive, but it might be hard with a WebEx session, but I just want you to like, look at the background of the slide and think about what it is. Uh, I've not told you what it is, but during the start talk, you will start deciphering what this background is and why this is important. Okay. So, and again, thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure to give this talk. Uh, let's start with a very simple question. First. The first thing is like, we have to go back to the drawing board and start thinking, uh, what is perception, right? Uh, perception is basically the ability to see, hear, or become aware of something through one senses. It's not sensing. Sensing is merely perceiving the physical information. Perception is making some sense out of the the sensory information you're getting, right? So it's it's more cognitive at a level. So the question next becomes, why do you need perception? Like, uh, 
50% of our human brain is committed to visual perception. Uh, the question becomes, why has evolution chosen it that way, right? Why is this important? Uh, the answer is actually fairly simple. Um, we need perception because we need to make some action, right? Like if you do not need to act, you do not need to perceive the world. It really doesn't matter, right? And the action obviously depends on what you are doing as a living agent. Um, if you are trying to navigate, you basically don't want to hit stuff. You don't want to be hit by stuff. So that becomes a very simplistic sensory motor loop wherein your your sense environment for obstacles, static and dynamic, and you're trying to act upon the information you're given. You're making sense out of that, and you're trying to dodge them. Right. Next is a question which divides the community of robotics as a whole. If I say, okay, action versus perception, which is more important? Uh, all the controls people in the audience are going to be like, oh yeah, like action is more important. What's the point of perception if you don't if you don't need to act, right? If you ask the perception people, they will basically be like, oh, perception is more important because 50% of your brain is actually doing that, right? I would argue that it's a chicken and egg problem uh, and you need one to do the other and both are equally important, right? One might be computationally more intensive than the other, but according to like a philosophical importance, I think both are super important and you, you need one for the other thing, right? Traditionally, um, about like up to a, dec a decade or two decades ago, uh, a lot of people in the field of robotics and computer vision did this thing called the passive approaches to perception, right? Which is you get a single snapshot of an image um, and you basically ask a classical method or a neural network, what is this and what should I do from there, right? And these are some examples where you're, you're given an adversarial example of food versus a dog. If you train a classifier to classify only dogs and it doesn't know anything about food, it would start classifying food as dog, right? Uh, as humans, we are really adept at this stuff. Though visually they look very similar, we get good at this stuff. Sometimes even for us humans, if the resolution of these images are fairly poor, it's very hard to know what is going on, right? So what we do as humans is we look at temporal information. We look at, is the dog breathing? Uh, we move around to get a, get a better view, right? We go interact with the dog. Is the dog gonna bark, right? Food doesn't bark, I hope our food doesn't bark, right? So we do action and interaction to gain and obtain more information, which is not possible with what I call as passive approaches to perception, right? Passive is single shot, you have one image and you basically got to make your life or death decision and that's it, it ends there, right? But in reality, uh, humans do this recursively. We never make a decision in one go. And it's the same thing with almost any living animal, right? And this becomes more apparent when we do a plot of autonomy versus size for robots. Uh, and in this particular case, autonomy is defined as the number of tasks that can be done by a robot within some time budget, right? Obviously, this only concerns with onboard sensing and computing. You don't have any external infrastructure to help you, right? When you have uh, to design algorithms of quarters with different sizes, you will generally notice that the amount of autonomy goes down with size, right? You might, look at this and believe that it's a linear decrease it's not here autonomy is in log scale right the number of tasks you can accomplish with a bigger robot is exponentially more than that of the smaller robot as of as of today right so in other words smaller robots are safer because they are tiny um, and there's less inertia to hit stuff um, and the propellers are safer but they're more agile because the moment of inertia is small but they're quote unquote unintelligent because the number of autonomy skills they can achieve is much smaller, right? On the other hand, um, bigger robots have a lot of sensors. They have a lot more compute. Uh, they are dangerous because like the propellers are huge. Uh, they're like flying meat grinders, as I would like to call them. Uh, they're bulky because they're physically heavy, but they're smarter in quotes, right? Smarter here refers to the fact that you can do more autonomous tasks with that robot, right? So this is all great. Um, as you have like a smaller robot, uh, you need to have a different philosophy than this, the bigger robots. In the bigger robots, passive kind of information is good enough, like we saw before. You can have a single shot image. You can basically be like, okay, have a giant uh, visual language model or a vision model like today. You can have like a very big uh, chat GPT like model on board, which can run, um, or you can basically connect to something like a bigger computer and it's enough to start making decisions on these giant networks, which are recognition and reconstruction based, right? But when you have a robot which is smaller, uh, you actually don't have that much compute, one. You don't have good quality sensors. 
and you can't even like do any of the stuff which bigger robots do, right? Like it's it's physically not even feasible. So in other words, size indeed does matter when it comes to robots and their autonomy problems. Um, so we need to compensate for having cheaper sensors and worse compute with moving moving our robot and utilizing action to gauge more information, just like how living beings do today. Right? You might be like. Nitin, why why does this matter? Why do you care about smaller drones? Yeah, they're they're cool, they're cool and nice, they're a beautiful research problem, but really does it matter? Why can't I just use a giant robot outside because it's flying in the air anyway? It really doesn't matter, right? I would say no, uh, because one is they're safer. Um if you're trying to rescue people, uh you're trying to put robots in cluttered spaces where safety becomes paramount. You don't want to hurt anybody or anything around you, right? Second thing is agility, uh, where time is of an essence, agility does matter. Um, you want to be able to like change your directions quickly, especially if you're in a dynamic environment like a forest fire or a disaster scenario like an earthquake where things are falling on you. Uh, you really want to be able to agilely navigate and like dodge dynamic obstacles, right? Obviously, smaller robots are amazing because uh, they can fit through spaces which bigger robots just physically cannot. Um, if you're trying to fly through rubble, this is super, super important because you want to find people who are who are maybe stuck under a rubble of a building or something like that, right? Moreover than that, it's like if you want to have a swarm of like, let's say, 1,000 robots, uh, where are we going to get a physical space to put 1,000 giant robots, right? Like that is physically not possible because... In disaster zones, you don't have like really clean arena to like deploy a thousand drones. Uh, smaller drones will just require smaller area. So it might much be easier to deploy these things in the wild, right? And I also mentioned a point about like doing all this stuff on the robot itself, right? With onboard sensing and onboard autonomy. You might be like, why does it matter? 5G is here, uh, 6G is gonna be out in the near future. Why, why do we care about this stuff? We have so much bandwidth for this stuff, right? One is security. Um, you do want to like uh, process on board so that it's secure and you don't send out information about private private information to the cloud, uh, which can be tapped by people, which can be used for destructive purposes. Uh, and uh, maybe people don't want uh, drones taking picture of their houses, right? And it's not a good idea. So security is a paramount thing. And generally, when you try to deploy this in the wild conditions of like disaster, uh, infrastructure is also fairly down, right? Like you have electrical grid, grids which are down and GPS might not be working because there's a lot of uh, rubble which are blocking the GPS signals. So you have to be robust to infrastructure failures, right? And finally, um, you really wanna be able to deploy this in the wild, right? When I say wild, you don't know what the conditions are. That's what wild here means, right? And the conditions could be really hard. Um, and if you are in a war driven sort of scenario, you might be thinking that, um, wild is basically like where GPS is jammed. So you actually don't have access to any of the aids, which you're generally used to on an aerial robot, right? This is all great. Uh, why is this problem hard? Why is it hard for a tiny robot to be autonomous? It should be fairly simple, right? Uh, people have done so much research on bigger robots. Can't we just take them and quote unquote scale it down? Because we have amazing neural network compression algorithms and things like that. Can't, can't we just scale it down, right? Cameras are small. Why would I, why do we care about this stuff? Um, the answer is actually simple and not so simple at the same time. Uh, one is size. Uh, when you are limited by size of the robot, there are physically smaller things you can put on the robot. There is a weight constraint, which is very severe on aerial robots because to have enough power to lift the stuff you want is not that easy. You have very limited memory. Of course, it keeps improving every year, but it's still compared to a bigger robot, it's very limited. And you're also limited in the kind of sensors you can put on board, right? You cannot put a LiDAR on board at least as of today. And it's, it makes life a lot harder than, than it needs to be for a bigger robot, right? And the battery technology currently is not there yet where you can say, oh, I have so much battery life that I don't really care. I can put whatever sensor I want and I can put a giant network on this and not care about power. So flight time becomes a crucial part when it comes to autonomous tiny robots because you want to like budget every little watt of power which goes in to compute or to actually flying to get to the distance to find the next survivor, right? Moreover than all of this, like when you actually talk about scale, remember I talked about swarms and I said, okay, like you want to deploy a thousand of these robots or 10,000 of these robots, cost becomes a prohibitive factor as well, right? Building a bigger drone just requires more resources and more things in general. And they're obviously a lot more costly 
uh, compared to a smaller robot, right? Uh, to manufacture a thousand small robots is a lot cheaper than to manufacture a thousand larger robots because the amount of material required and raw material required for every little component in the robot itself, right? So hopefully I've convinced you that smaller robots are useful and doing this onboard makes a lot of sense. Um, let's go back to the slide from before. Um, this is where we had left off and I had remo I removed a bunch of other things which were there in the slide. If you compare the autonomous drones we have, which humans have built, compare that to nature, um, you see that like we are very, very far away from where nature is, right? And one more thing I wanted to recall is autonomy is in log scale. So obviously like even the honeybee, which is like much smaller than our smallest robot today, uh, can actually do a lot more autonomy tasks just with its like 100,000 neuron brain than what the robots can do with a lot larger quote unquote brains, right? So let's look at a small video of how this actually makes a difference, right? Birds and insects are masters of flight. Birds solve the complex navigation task of flying through narrow gaps at high speeds with relative ease as they have adapted their eyes to sense at high speed. Right? Birds can do this really, really well. Um, but life is not that simple when you're an insect. You do not have the good quality eyes or the computation power required. You need to wander around the gap and then servo towards it to go inside. Right? You saw that the strategies used by a bird and a bee are very different, but they both accomplish the task of finding the gap and going through it. Right? This brings me to the core essence of this entire talk, which is called the active approach to perception, which is do you want to think like the bird or do you want to think like the bee? It depends, right? Uh, both birds and bees have amazing things. Um, they make it work um, and they survive. They survive for millions of years. Uh, we are talking more towards the kind of algorithms a bee will do because we want to go towards the minimalist solution, which is minimum in terms of sensors, minimum in terms of compute, um, and be able to achieve what is seemingly impossible today with the classical or how we think about robots today, right? With the classic... Uh, perception control and planning frameworks. So let's go back to our plot from before. Um, this is where we had uh, with our new smarter minimalist active drone design. The word active here means that we utilize the sense of that we can move and we can move to get more information like I was hinting to before to actually gauge more information and to, to accomplish the task we set out to do. Right? With this active drone design, uh, over the years, we basically have increased the amount of autonomy. Uh, we are approaching what a honeybee can do today. And this is where the robot is, right? So we have a tiny palm-sized robot uh, with about a billion neurons, which is greater than the number of neurons a sparrow hawk has. We are at the si at weight about 250 grams, which is again the weight of a sparrow hawk, a real bird, right? We are at the size of a hummingbird. So physically we have enough uh, like mechanical structure to build something which is small, but capabilities, we are still smaller than that of a honeybee, I would say, right? We are getting there. We are still not at what a honeybee can actually achieve, right? And there's a lot of reasons for it, and we will sort of unravel these reasons as we go along in the talk. So comparing with the state of the art, um, on the smaller scale, you have like these small scale flyers, like insect based, which are only to show that you can actually fly. They cannot do any compute. Uh, they don't even actually have onboard power, right? Uh, a little one step up, you can basically start using these specialized smartphone processors, uh, put like one camera on it and actually maybe start doing very rudimentary tasks, right? You can get one more level higher where you can bring in a little more sensors, you can bring in a sonar, you can bring in a small one beam LiDAR to hold position, you can do a bunch of stuff, right? You can, you can start increasing the size of the robot and the amount of compute also starts going up and you can obviously start doing a lot more autonomous tasks, right? And again, these are over the years. You'll see that uh, there are products in the market which have mastered this engineering and the research skill, uh, like the Skydio R1, which utilizes the concept of active vision to get information by movement and also it utilizes the best advances in hardware and software to actually be able to achieve a lot higher amount of autonomy than what is possible classically, right? And obviously, as you go along on the right side here, you will see that um, there are robots with bigger, bulkier sensors and a lot more compute, which can do a lot more stuff, right? And the Skydio drone is fairly important. Remember that because utilizing active vision concepts with classical infrastructure and like boosting everything you can do can actually give you a lot of performance boost, right? 
And where do we stand in this? Over the years, we have uh, gone down in size and we have gone up in the autonomy level. Um, and uh, I have left this to 2023 because you will see what happened in 2024 in, in a bit, right? The question is, how did we achieve this? Like, what's the philosophical idea here, right? So we call it parsimonious solution, which is being thrifty with what you have, but you want to actually do really cool stuff, right? So we said, okay, we have a bunch of navigational tasks, uh, which we want to achieve. Can we sort of like group them in an onion peed kind of way, wherein you need the one below it to achieve the next one, right? It's a hierarchy here. So, and that's what we did. And we found that this actually works really, really well. And this is closer to how actually living beings actually function, right? So the first one is stabilization. We want to like make sure that we are stable. Then we utilize that to know what is not moving like us, which is independently moving objects. So we segment them. We utilize the combination of these two to identify static and dynamic obstacles. So we do obstacle avoidance with that. Then we can basically maintain a vector to where we started from, which we call home. So we can home back. And then you can utilize all this and you can combine that with homing to go back to where you started and we call it landing. And this is just one example. You can come up with your own different hierarchy of competences for different tasks. This is for the task of plant pollination. And this entire ring is one agent, right? And if I zoom out, um, you can expand this to multiple agents as well. You can bring in another agent, your friend, and you can start doing cooperative landing. And the cooperative landing could be basically for like uh, recharging purposes. Uh, you can bring in more agents here and you can start thinking about swarm pursuit and avoidance and so on and so forth, right? Uh, these are again, very specific to plant pollination, but you can take this at, from a conceptual level to a lot of different tasks. Right. So we came up with four different forms of activeness, which is four different ways you can get more information by moving. Uh, what I mean by moving here will become more clear in a second, right? Uh, first one, and just to recap that our robot is the size of a real hummingbird, this uh, picture should sort of remind you of that. Right? The first one is you physically move yourself, which is you have your robot, uh, you command it to go left, right, up, down, back, front, uh, you move yourself. Second one is what we call as active sensing. You build a sensor which only gives you information when something moves, right? And so you get amount of activeness built into the way the sensor works. You can move apart, uh, like we move our necks, we move our eyeballs, uh, we move our, we rotate our neck and that's moving apart, right? And if you do this well enough, you can actually build neural network model, hallucinate this motion, right? You actually don't have to physically move. And this is more like, Okay, younger people move a lot because they have a lot of energy. As you get older, you can sort of predict what is going to happen in the future because you've seen a lot of life. Uh, our robots can actually do the same thing, right? Uh, let me zoom out and let me say that this talk is focused entirely on navigation in the wild. When I say wild, this is what I mean by for the conditions, right? We don't have GPS uh, because infrastructure can fail. We don't have an external motion capture system, which gives us precise localization. So that doesn't exist. We don't have a cloud computer where we can cheat and send information and get a lot of massive compute on the back end. So we don't have that. And we also don't really know where we are flying, which means that we don't have a prior map. Uh, if we had a prior map, life becomes a lot easier, but we don't, right? And everything has to be like perceived and like reacted on the fly. Okay? Navigation in the wild generally contains three scenarios, uh, flying through narrow gaps, dodging dynamic obstacles, and flying through cluttered and unstructured scenes. Unstructured becomes important because we don't really know where we are, right? If we had a map, it's it's a structured scene, it becomes a lot simpler, but we don't know that, right? Okay. That brings me to one of the first works uh, where we present a method to detect and fly through a gap of unknown shape, size, and location, which is a single camera, right? On the top left, you see that there is a competence chart from before, and anything which is colored in blue, basically we can achieve that with this particular work, okay? And it's gonna be consistent throughout the talk. So just like you saw in the B video, our approach starts by moving around or surveying the scene, takes multiple snapshots. The motion is controlled in a way that the optical flow, which is the motion of pixels, becomes a function of inverse depth. Uh, we can use this and use multiple information, combine them into one thing, detect the gap, and basically fly through it, right? And uh, so that works very well. Um, and uh, like, okay, just a simple strategy of motion gives us so much information which did not exist before, right? And this is like the first part of activeness where you move yourself. In the second part of activeness, we utilize this thing called an event camera. The idea of an event camera is it gives you intensity changes of pixels 
uh, and that will only happen when something is moving right if your camera is static nothing is changing in the scene you get you get no events because nothing is changing when something moves around in front of the camera or you move the camera around uh, you can basically get events back right and the most beautiful part about this event camera is that it's modeled after how our eyes work our eyes are actually very sensitive motion detectors and that's why even in low light we can actually see something move past very quickly even if we cannot actually see color right and the same idea is utilized by a lot of insects and a lot of birds um, especially the smaller they are the more event like their processing becomes right they're more worried about motion because something can kill them or something can hit them uh, they're more worried about that so it becomes a very reactive maneuver right so we, we utilize this we put this on a robot and we started dodging dynamic obstacles, right? Uh, here you have a robot, you see you have a, it has a front-facing and down-facing camera. We start throwing stuff at the robot just by the virtue of motion uh, and a couple of neural networks, it can actually figure out where the obstacle is and actually take a decision to go the other way around, right? Uh, so it works fairly well. And this was basically the active sensing part which we talked about. And I also talked about moving a part of the body. Uh, we incorporated that into this uh, work by basically moving the Two cameras of the baseline this is the equivalent of if you could move your eyes in and out um we can't but let's let's imagine you could um and that is what it would look like right and this is modeled after the behavior of how eagles function they change their focus to focus like something up to four miles away so we basically took the cameras we physically moved it around right and it was easier to do that so that's how we implemented that uh, this actually made uh, uh, sensor stack becomes smaller when it gets closer to an obstacle and become bigger when it's farther away so that it can actually look at very far distances and actually fly really fast, right? So here on the bottom bar, you will see a blue to red transition bar and color map. It goes from 10 centimeters to 30 centimeters of baseline, right? Uh, I want to quickly note that 30 centimeters is much bigger than the robot itself. And as this video plays, it's a stabilized video because I was running behind this. Uh, You'll see the video glitch a little, but you, I just wanted to observe that like the cameras move front, like closer and backwards as you look at the bottom bar and the camera itself, right? So this shows you the current and history of baselines or the distance to the camera. So you see the quad rotor like navigate through complex forest with ease, and this is pretty fast actually. It speeds up to five meters per second, um, and we are adjusting the baseline based on the closest depth to the image. And it's navigating here in the direction of due north, right? Uh, behind that tree is where it would actually land. And this works fairly well. Uh, it's a very simple strategy. Um, and even with this simple strategy, we could actually achieve things which was not achieved at the scale before, right? So now taking a complete step back uh, for the last, uh, 25, 30 minutes, we have talked about three different things, flying through gaps of unknown shape and size by moving ourselves, dodging dynamic obstacles using uh, this like active sensor called event camera. And the last one is basically flying through a forest, which is unstructured and cluttered through basically a stereo camera with variable baseline, right? There is some fundamental commonality in the way all these things are processed, right? which is they use some representation of a motion field, which is invoked by some motion which you are a part of, right? So we can take this fundamental ideology and we can unify multiple problems together, right? And I call this minimal perception. And this idea is gonna be essential in, in the work which we are gonna talk about from now on, right? So we utilize this concept called optical flow. Uh, which I put I put it as a question that is, is the ultimate motion representation? A lot of people in the field believe so. Uh, optical flow is just basically, if you have two images, it, if you draw vectors of where each uh, each pixel moved from image one to image two, that's, that's optical flow, right? And you can show this as a color-coded map. Um, and if you take two frames from this video, um, and this is what the color-coded map looks like, right? The way you read this color-coded map is, look at the color wheel on the bottom left, uh, basically, the center is basically uh, zero, which is white. And anything as you go out, you see that the saturation increases. The saturation refers to the magnitude and the hue refers to the direction itself. Right? So similar colors and similar saturation means it's similar kind of movement. That's that's all I want you to remember from this slide. Right? If you want to get really fancy about uh, the math here, I promise 
there are only three equations in the entire slide deck this is one of them uh, you'll notice that like the it has two components the first part and the second part the first part you see that z there z is just basically the depth or how far something is in the scene right so optical flow indeed does depend on how far something is and this is the way you think about it is if something is really far away like a mountain even if the mountain is moving around when you're driving you actually don't see the motion right versus if you are there's a car in front of you which is overtaking somebody else you see that the motion is a lot higher right and that's why it's inversely right this p dot x which is optical flow assumes that the point can be seen in both the images image one and image two for be to be able to match between two images you should be able to see the point right let's look at a point which is on the boundary remember that we had that like little green color uh, rock like things if you look at a pixel just inside the rock and a pixel just outside the rock, which is on the carpet, and let's zoom into that. What can happen is uh, the optical flow estimation becomes ill-conditioned at object boundaries, right? And the reason this is, is because if you move in a particular way, the rock can occlude something else. Or if you move the opposite way, uh, you can see some other point which was occluded by the rock before, right? These are called accretions and deletions due to occlusion. This makes it hard for optical flow to work really well along the edges, right? So let's call this uh, function epsilon, like uh, which looks like a gamma. And let's say you have your optical flow, which you're predicting, which is the red quantity there. You have the ground truth optical flow, which is blue. Remember that in the real world, you don't have this ground truth optical flow quantity, but let's say you were training a neural network and you have this like exact ground truth optical flow magically. Uh, what I would say is basically this error is going to be high, right? Like this thing, which is the difference between the actual thing and your prediction, which means that your prediction will break at the object boundaries, right? So again, just to summarize, um, optical flow assumes that there is brightness consistency and it's ill-conditioned and object boundaries due to occlusions and deletions. Uh, in essence, optical flow alternative will be high at object boundaries. That's the key takeaway from the slide. That's what I want you to remember, right? So remember that we want to squeeze out more information because we are an active agent, we are parsimonious. So given whatever information we have, we want to quickly extract as much content as we can from that, right? Without a lot of compute, right? So in the words of Adam Grant, if knowledge is power, knowing what you don't know is wisdom. And we are going to take that quite literally in this particular case. What I mean by that is knowing when something fails actually has a lot of information about uh, what is actually going on, right? And we are going to utilize that in, in a couple of minutes. So some of you who work on depth-based cameras might be like, why why care about this stuff? Why do you want to do all this stuff without uh, without depth, right? Um, you, it's a, it's a fairly valid question. Uh, that's what we asked as well. Uh, this is basically Chahat flying the drone into another drone where this view is taken from. Uh, this is the onboard camera of a robot, wherein its goal is to dodge the quad rotor that is coming towards it, right? If you look at the input, we fed this to a, one of the state-of-the-art visual transformer networks in 2023, and that's why the date actually is 2023. Uh, we visualize the depth map output as a heat map uh, where like it goes from uh, hot to cool, a uh, hot is closer and cool is farther away. Uh, you, If you zoom in on Chahat here, you will see that half of Chahat does not exist to this depth network, right? Um, does it mean uh, what's going on? Should Chahat wear clothes like this? Should we all wear clothes like this? If a robot has to not hit us? Probably not, that really doesn't make sense, right? Uh, what I mean to say is these depth networks are fairly biased, even though they're very large, uh, like large in terms of model size and amount of compute they require, they actually don't generalize well to unshot or zero shot scenes. Right? which you don't know what is going on. And this is very commonly encountered in aerial robots because they're flying in unstructured and un like cluttered environments where your, your network is not trained to work well. Okay. So like I was saying, we need to worry about where the network doesn't work, which basically brings us to uncertainty. And there are two kinds of uncertainty. First one is aleatoric or observational. Second one is epistemic or model, right? I'll explain to you what this is in one second. Um, uh, both of them talk about inherent biases a network or an algorithm has. The aleatoric uncertainty talks about the essence wherein the way the sensor collects data, right? Uh, to give an example, uh, if you have a camera, your camera cannot see through objects. 
So you will almost always have uncertainty at the boundaries of the object, like we saw in the optical flow example, right? Epistemic uncertainty has to do more with the way that the data was used for training. If you train something on an outdoor scene, it has probably never seen a table or a couch, right, on the road. Uh, there are couches in Massachusetts, people throw out couches on the road, but it's unlikely that you would see that, right? Uh, and if you deploy this in an indoor scene for an indoor robot to do obstacle avoidance, it wouldn't work well, right? Because there is nothing for it to go from where it actually knows what's going on, right? And so this bias comes from the scenarios that are used for the training data. So we are going to be focusing on aleatoric uncertainty, which is more native to the way the sensor works uh, because it's cheaper to compute and it also the conceptually will generalize across sensors, right? So this uh, work basically got us to the cover of Science Robotics uh, in August, 2023. Um, and let me break down this title because it's a mouthful. So we are estimating something called as general heteroscedastic aleatoric uncertainty. Uh, the word heteroscedastic just means that the output depends upon the image, uh, which is like we are trying to say, okay, given this input image, where are we actually uncertain about, right? We want to reason about the uncertainty about that particular image, which is squeezing out every bit of information that is there or what we don't know, right? Um, aleatoric just means that is the uncertainty to do with the sensor itself. And we are particularly utilizing the fact that cameras actually cannot see through objects here, right? Uh, which is they're uncertain around object boundaries, right? So that brings us to the second equation of this uh, talk, which is basically this fancy looking equation. Let me break this down for you. You have your neural network, which is currently being trained with this function f, which could be whatever uh, fancy function of your liking, right? It's your error metric, which you use to train the weights on the argument argument there. You replace that uh, function with this function, right? And there are a couple of things which you need to know. Um, here, the epsilon, the green thing, is basically the uncertainty per pixel uh, if you're using an image. Uh, if it's per it's per sequence, if you're using a sequence data, right? And it works across data data types. It is independent of what data you're using, right? F is your error metric from before. G just has to be a positive monotonic function if you're using epsilon for uncertainty. And H has to be a negative monotonic function to balance these two variables out, right? So that you don't basically get like garbage results or like trivial results, right? F here makes network predict the correct things. Correct here is with respect to either a self-supervised label or a supervised label, which is denoted by the blue thing there. G penalizes for all high values of uh, your uncertainty. Your network shouldn't say everything is uncertain, I don't know. That's not a good idea. And H is basically acting as a loss attenuator to balance these two functions so that the, the numerical order between these two is actually balanced, right? Again, for simple functions, we can actually indeed prove that this is optimal. Uh, but when it comes to neural networks, it becomes really actually hard to say, okay, this actually will converge to the solution, right? So what we did is we took the next best thing, which is observational inference. We took this equation. We knew that this hypothesis likely is true. We went back 10 years of research and we basically plugged in every single equation from every single literature work. And indeed, this equation was valid for every single work that was available till then, right? Which makes makes us uh, confident that like, okay, this was the underlying distribution which was working, right? And on the bottom of the slide, I show that like for Gaussian and Laplacian, you can actually get back optimal estimates uh, if you're using a simple linear model, right? And so it, it get, you get back the actual optimal estimates which has been used classically in control theory for a long time, right? In this paper, we focused on unconventional uses of uncertainty. What I mean by that is the conventional usage of uncertainty of a sensor is to use it for sensor fusion, like a Kalman filter. We said, obviously we can do that. Uh, we don't wanna focus on that. Uh, it's fairly simple of how to do that. We wanna say, okay, like you have uncertainty, what else can you do with this uncertainty, right? That was the question we asked. So we focused on four different tasks. One was uh, dodging dynamic obstacles. Then you have basically navigation on cluttered and unstructured scenes. Then you have flying through unknown shape gaps and then segmenting of a scene on the bottom right, right? Um, I'll play a video in the next slide. Hopefully it works. Uh, it's a 50-50% chance of it working. Let's see. So in this particular case, you see that like uh, we are gonna throw obstacles at the robot uh, and uh, yeah, the video is scrambled and like I said, 50-50% chance of working, right? Uh, so at least half of the video is working, I hope. Um, 
and uh, here you would you would have seen that the the robot would basically like dodge uh, static obstacles video and we are basically utilizing this uncertainty of optical flow to get where there is free space with motion there is a beautiful looking video on the link which i will show next uh, you can go watch that it's a much higher quality video anyway but uh, you sort of have to take my word and believe that okay this this works right okay and uh, obviously let's pretend that you saw this video and it worked um, you're convinced that this works well um, and you want to play around uh, this is open source uh, on this link uh, you can actually download this network you can play with it you can put your own images through and see what the uncertainty gives you and you'll be surprised for how how well it works right and again remember that this network is fairly small uh, it can run on board a robot um, at about eight hertz uh, so it's fairly 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 small right so i'll show you more image examples here because the video was like a little weird uh, so for dodging dynamic obstacles, this is Chahat throwing uh, basically a toy airplane at the robot. Uh, we saw that like even with the depth camera, it's really hard to know because there is motion involved. Even with these like fancy depth networks, it's again, it's a blurry mess, right? Like you don't see that. Uh, with methods which actually work with occlusions and like things like uncertainty, like the occlusion mask or our paper Agya, it actually works really well, which means to show that like you don't really have to worry about estimating depth. All you need to know is that there's something weird going on here and I just don't want to hit it, right? And that's similar to how we as humans function. If somebody throws something at you, you're not sitting there and thinking how far it is or what it is. You just want to get away from that, right? And this is more closer to that philosophy. Uh, another serendipitous thing that happened is when we were experimenting with the uh, simulated forest to get data for our paper. We noticed that um, actually in the back slide, like the path length is actually fairly comparable uh, to, to the other like depth based methods and it works fairly well. The other fun thing which happened was like, if you look at the branches, uh, you will see that the depth networks basically omit the talk because most of these depth networks don't work well in object boundaries where there are thin structures, but our network, even despite not being explicitly trained for it, actually works really well because it cares about occlusions, right? Even a thin branch actually gives you very good occlusion interference. So we actually found that like things like this can be really useful to avoid like power lines, which are actually really hard to detect. And this was serendipitous because we never intended it for to work that way, right? To give you perspective of how small our network is, the Intel Midas here is 83.1 million parameters. It's about 1.34 gigabytes. Uh, of a model size our paper is 2.7 million parameters and it's uh, just 10 megabytes right uh, and again like flying through unknown shape caps the same thing works well and you'll see that like compared to like depth based methods which are fairly biased uh, so they cannot detect these weird looking object shapes our method actually works very very well right um, as you get like rectangular structures the bigger model midas on the bottom here works fairly well but the other things don't Okay, so this is all great. Uh, this would have been easy if all of this worked. Uh, the problem is, remember I told you that it only works at about eight hertz um, on a big chunky or in nano computer. Uh, so it's pretty compute intensive, but we wanna deploy this on robots which are even smaller, right? Um, so what do we do, right? So we wanna go back to edge computers, which are great. And we use this thing called the Google Coral TPU, edge TPU in this case which is uh, two watts of power, uh, two ter operations per second per watt of power. And it's small, it's lightweight, and somebody holding it in their hand shows you how small it is. And it's fairly cheap. It's only $20 to buy this, right? Like not even in bulk, in just like single units, right? Uh, the only problem is that it supports only unsigned integer eight operations. So no, no floating point. Uh, it's not as beautiful as our previous work, wherein we were happily using float 64 bit float integers to compute everything, it was easy. You don't have that. It only supports a limited amount of layers. And this is not particularly made for regression tasks. Right? If we recap this with optical flow, we need flow 32 outputs. We have a large output range because they can go from negative to positive. And this is indeed a regression task, right? And this is centered around deconvolution or upconvolution layers, right? So this brings us to a work which actually got accepted a few hours ago, about 12 hours ago, today morning, right? This is as hot as it can get off the press, right? Um, on the top left, if you see that, I put a little plus plus there. 
which means to show that you can actually do all of this stuff with this work, but much faster. Right? And that's what plus plus here means, or much better in this particular case. Uh, we could basically achieve 100 uh, frames per second using just one watt of power of tense optical flow on a tiny, tiny robot, right? Uh, you might have a sense of scale of the robot on this uh, image. This robot is what you saw before. It's about 120 millimeters across. So it's the size of the palm of my hand. And right? so it's fairly small. So there are two secrets in this paper, which I will unravel uh, in two slides. The first one is to speed. Uh, this is the ground truth optical flow of a network of a data set called flying chairs. If you train this on a simple standard like GPU, um, you get about uh, 113 hertz. Uh, endpoint error is basically the L2 distance between the ground truth and your prediction, about 4 and 4.3 pixels. And this is full flow 32 outputs on a 30 NVIDIA 3060 GPU, right? You take this and you convert this into a coral uh, HTPO, which we saw before. You lose accuracy. It goes to 5.3 pixels. Um, and we do a bunch of scaling and to fit it in the UN date range. But you see that the FPS drops to 14 hertz. So it's one tenth of the speed now. So that's sad. Uh, we do a bunch of tricks, which I will tell you what it is, and we can get the speed back to 103 hertz. Uh, you obviously lose a little more accuracy. You go from 5.3 to 5.6, so you lose about 0.3 pixels accuracy. You'll see that there's a little line in the middle if you're very, very sharp about it, right? That's not that's not an artifact on the slide. That's indeed what we are doing, right? So let me break that down. Instead of just feeding in two images into a network to get optical flow, we actually just chunk the image into four parts, right? You might be wondering, why four parts? What we found is this hardware architecture works really well for batches. The speed up you get when you batch something up is much faster than when you increase the X and Y dimension, right? And because it's optical flow, we are just trying to match between two images. We knew that like around the edges where of the uh, chunk, it will be really bad, but it doesn't matter so much, right? We can sort of like blur it out and smooth it out and it, it really makes no difference, right? So we take these chunks, uh, we shove this, uh, and we make this four cross this. So we put it in the batch dimension. We throw it into the same exact network. Nothing has changed, right? And you get things which are much faster. And, and we actually reconstruct the four things back, right? Uh, you'll see that the error goes up a little because you have this boundary conditions. It's almost the same as before. It's not too bad, but the speed up is 10 times higher. And this is observation number one, right? It's a very simple observation. Again, we just embarked on this when we were playing around with this stuff, right? This is specific to that architecture. The good news is the same ideology holds true for almost all accelerated architectures, right? It's not just GP or TPUs, it is the same thing for GPUs as well, right? So you can utilize the same trick and put it on a GPU and you can call it a day, right? If you're thinking, okay, I care about these edges, what do I do, right? You can have overlapping edges and you can just average the values out, right? Um, if you read the paper, again, we talk about all that. You lose a little bit of speed, you gain a little bit of accuracy. It's a beautiful little trade-off game you can play here, right? So we chunk the images to get almost the same speed as the original GPU implementation, right? And the secret to accuracy, because we lost accuracy, is we come up with this novel multi-scale pyramidal ResNet. Uh, pyramid networks are not new. Uh, we are not the first people to come up with this. Uh, people have done this for 20 years in computer vision. The cool trick we did here was we basically said, okay, in the pyramid, instead of predicting the actual output, we will only predict the increments, right? And we forced the network to utilize the full resolution of the UNT8 integer operation so that it could basically add it up in a particular way that uh, if you observe the second row of outputs, you'll see that it's incrementally predicting more and more edges, right? We came up with the loss function, which actually emphasizes that uh, along with the uncertainty. So we could actually build this stuff in a much nicer way, right? So the uncertainty got sharper, the optical flow got sharper, and I'll show you the results in a second, but we went down from 5.6 pixels to 3.6 pixels, which is, if you remember, if you're keeping track, it's better than the original GPU implementation than without the ResNet, right? So to show you some visual results, if you take the same thing, put it on the GPU, obviously it works even better. It's 2.7 pixels now, and this is pretty close to the state of the art, right? Uh, the state of the art is at about uh, one and a half pixels, uh, but again, remember we are about 10 times faster than that, right? So this is very good result in that regard, right? Uh, you take the same thing, you put it on the Coral TPU, you get to 21 Hertz. Again, you do the same chunking operation again, you get to 3.67, right? Not much of a difference, 
Uh, if you observe the rightmost thing and the leftmost thing and you compare, there are artifacts in the middle, but it's fairly good, right? The green chair is sort of gone somewhere because it's too thin of a structure for it to work well. But for the bigger chairs, like the pink one or the red one, it actually works very well, right? So when we combine these two things, uh, we basically started at 4.3 pixels error and 113 hertz on a desktop GPU with flow 32 operations. We went down to 3.6 pixels and about 88 or 89% on the core TPU, right? So we have a variant of this, which goes up to 3.9 pixels and 100 hertz. So you can pick whichever you want here, right? So we basically have similar accuracy and speed on a, on a HTPU computer with 85 times lesser power and 100 times lighter and smaller package, right? Which is fairly nice, right? Uh, we put it on the same tasks you saw before and uh, we achieved 20 times faster inference and we are 20% more accurate than the previous state of the art and the previous science robotics paper you just saw, right? And again, this is all running on a tiny small robot, right? Again, this is also open source. You can go play with this. Um, it's not out yet, but the link is there. We will push out the code in the next two days, right? So you just watch out for that, right? Uh, I'm about to finish. So remember that we started with navigation in the wild, but in all the previous scenarios, if you are keeping tabs, you saw that each of the scenarios, they were carefully crafted, right? Uh, we were dodging dynamic obstacles. We were going through unknown shape gaps. We were flying through a cluttered scene, but you knew what of these scenarios it was. In real world, you never know that. Um, if you're trying to deploy a robot in the wild, you actually will never prior know what, which one of these stuff you're gonna encounter, right? And this is a paper we just submitted uh, a few hours ago. Again, it's as hot as it can get. Uh, we basically say, why can't we figure this out on the fly, right? Like utilizing the concept from Agya and EdgeFlowNet, we say, okay, we can do minimalist navigation, just utilizing those concepts. If we can figure out which of these scenarios will occur on the flight, right? Uh, we are inspired again by the bee, uh, wherein the bee moves around. Uh, this is called peering and it figures out what it needs to do. Again, you're seeing in this particular case, it's a different gap. It goes into the gap, right? Uh, we do the same thing. Uh, we basically move around. We utilize optical flow. We utilize uncertainty. We utilize both of these things to reason what is happening in the scene, right? On the top right here, you will see the inference of what the robot thinks is actually happening. Uh, remember that the robot doesn't have any knowledge of the prior ordering, or it does not know what, it knows that there are three scenarios it can encounter because in the world, there are only three scenarios which come into navigation. It does not know which of these are present. It does not know the ordering or the location of these things, right? Remember that. The top right is basically a prediction of the robot itself. So it correctly predicts that we are going through static obstacles. Um, and again, the peering motion from the BVs is saw. It's utilizing the same information as before, and it tries to go inside, right? And then it figures out that it sees a gap because the gap is enclosed, and it goes through the gap, and it's again moving around. Uh, and you'll see that at the end, like one of my students is gonna swing a box on the robot, and it's actually gonna dodge that, right? Uh, so the robot had correctly figured out that there's a weird dynamic obstacle in this view, right? Great. Uh, going back to the plot we started with, uh, this is where we were. I promised to show you where we are in this year. Uh, this is where we were in 2023. And in 2024, I put a gray box here because we are still doing research. We still have a few more months, so we know we are going to push this boundary even further, right? Uh, but I would still say there is a long way to go to hit even the agent of a bee. One thing which can actually help us get there is that robots are embodied agents, which means that we can take a cheat sheet from genetic evolution, right? Robots which operate in particular environments have evolved in particular ways, both in terms of sensing and compute and the way they think and the representations. I think we as researchers should take a step back rather than being forced into our rooms, doing a lot of fancy math just because we like it. We should take a step back and really think, does this matter, right? And I think that's missing in the community. I think that becomes a very important thing for us to think about, right? And there's a lot of talk about embodied AI, wherein you really want to think about AI that goes on a robot with the knowledge of its own self and embodiment. And I think that is a very important direction, right? So we can use multiple sensors on the robot. We can utilize multiple interaction modalities. We can use different kinds of action and different kinds of visual representations, which will help us get there, right? To conclude, we talked about how robots can be made parsimonious by thinking about 
a hierarchy of competences. We talked about four different forms of activeness. Uh, we talked about the science robotics paper where we said, okay, we can generalize uncertainty, eke out more information. And then we saw that like we could basically utilize all this information to navigate in the wild, uh, actually without knowing any prior knowledge of what kind of obstacles you will encounter. And we saw how we can actually deploy this on a tiny robot by accelerating this entire thing, right? Uh, for people who, again, these are all the publications and like they're linked in the slides, you can click on them. Uh, thanks to all the sponsors. Again, uh, this is all work done by my students. I'm super proud of all of them. Uh, I have just helped them, uh, but it's all their work. Um, and again, like all the previous works you saw is in a collaboration with a lot of uh, people across the world. Um, and on the bottom row, they all started as students. When I was a student, they've all become professors or, or uh, doctors at this point, uh, which is great. Um, and I have the um, conclusion slide as well here if anybody has any questions. Wow. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sanke. Super cool research. Okay. It's very uh, great to see uh, how it's uh, uh, being deployed in uh, reality. Uh, and also congratulations uh, for the accepted paper and best of luck to your new submission. Thank you so much. So uh, first, let's see if we do have any questions from our audience. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, unmute yourself. I have a more of an implementation. Hi, Pratik here. I have Thanks. a more of an implementation based question. So uh, you, if you can go back to the slide where you have results for the tree branch uh, between Midas and your uh, paper. Give me one so second. The, sure. This is the tree branch thing, right? Right. This should be it, right? Is this the one? What's the overarching logic that you're using? Because I see there's less uncertainty in the middle of the tree as well. So what's stopping the drone from going into the tree? I'm curious like how the overall logic works. That's an amazing question. So basically that is the that is one of the biggest limitations of just using uncertainty. What happens is, remember that like we talked about aleatoric uncertainty that it's uncertain at the edges, right? Um, it's right. uncertain at the edges because you can have occlusions, right? Like all these stuff. I don't know if you see my mouse. Do you see my mouse? Yes, I do. Okay, awesome. So if you look at this edge of the tree and this edge of the tree, obviously the uncertainty is very high. And on the branch, it's even higher because as you move around, the branch is occluding a lot of stuff, correct? So what happens is even in the middle, as you move around, there is a good amount of uncertainty. It's much higher than the background but it's much lower than these things. And remember that this uncertainty is actually in the real number line. It's compressed here to just show the information. And what we do in implementation is we actually like do a nonlinear stretch. And when we threshold it, you actually get even the middle as high enough uncertainty to actually dodge it, right? But we found that that can still be a problem if it's a very fat looking object. Like if this tree was like five times wider, that would be a problem because in the middle, you actually will not have much uncertainty because it's not moving much, right? So that's exactly why you saw in the Minna paper, we combine that with optical flow as well, right? When you start moving left and right, because this object is close to you, you will actually see a very high, high value of optical flow, which we utilize that along with uncertainty to actually dodge. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense. Thank you. Amazing presentation. Yeah, thank you. And I don't know if you can like type in the questions as well. I don't know if I can read them. Uh, that also works. Uh, so I don't see any questions uh, on the chat section. So uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, so so for these drones to work, are they being uh, tasked to go from A to B? And then uh, once they're trying to accomplish that task and then they uh, encounter some obstacles, then they do that. Uh, planning or, for example, detecting the whole, uh, how to uh, avoid uh, hitting them? Or do... Yeah, great question. So there are, okay, so what we focus on is basically, we say you're navigating towards a direction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more closer to the goal we were talking about before, right? The goal is basically you want to find a survivor. 
when you're finding a survivor you're searching in a direction let's say north right like or like east uh, when your your goal is to maximize distance covered in north and you basically want to keep going north irrespective of what happens along the way right and that's the kind of problems we are solving and again this is very rudimentary in the sense that it's the minimal amount of information you have right if you say you have an exact location you want to go it's more information it it's going to be more optimal than the work the work you see here right it's going to hurt us it's actually going to help us more right because yeah. if we can dodge in a particular direction to actually get closer to the goal it actually helps us more I see I see yeah and and also uh, one, one other thing uh so so r- right now these uh, uh drones are individual agents uh but uh can you uh think about them in a cooperative manner so uh, w- can they benefit uh, from a plan that's from a map that is being constructed of a particular scene or environment to further complement what they're doing yeah that's a great question i mean 100% i mean right now we are pushing the boundary wherein you cannot have a map right because it says okay what can you actually be creative about if there is no map because map is a very strong informational cue right you have a lot of information going on when you have a map of something so even without a map we can push the boundary of what is possible when you give a map it becomes a lot more easier somewhere okay. because you have a lot more information but again the trade off is you need a lot more compute right okay. to actually process that map it's a lot more expensive so the way i think about it in my head is you keep doing all this stuff at a much faster rate and the mapping thing can run at a much slower rate on a robot right like if this is running at 100 hertz the mapping at 1 hertz so you you run both uh, you save compute by doing both um and if you have multiple agents again you can decide what to share what not to share uh, that communication modality again becomes a whole different paradigm which is important because if you have 10 robots sharing information which is important across 10 robots is important right yeah, yeah, yeah. but what yeah. to share again becomes a whole different paradigm which a lot of people are working on um it's it's a it's an amazing problem as well Thanks thanks. Uh also I do uh, see a question uh, on the uh, chat. As LLMs get smaller and uh, chips with network stacks get smaller, do you think the compute required can be moved to the edge uh which is mobile or uh, Wi-Fi networks and still be processed fast enough to avoid obstacles or process more autonomy on a smaller drone? Yeah, that's a that's a great question and uh I keep asking that question to my students all the time. I'm like, why do we care about this stuff? Um because obviously networks get smaller, your compute gets faster. Uh, every single day like uh, companies like Nvidia, Intel, Qualcomm build better chips, right? Like so we have more compute and the same amount of power budget. The way I think about it as a researcher is okay, if you can achieve something at like 10 cm today, you can achieve the same thing in about 10 mm tomorrow. you can always change the constraint ladder and you can say okay i really want to push this to be the size of a b what do we need to get there right so llms do help you um to get there because whatever you can do with 10 cm today in like 5 years from now on you can obviously do like 10 or 100 times more which is awesome uh, llms will help you get there you can do a lot more tasks remember on the autonomy scale you can keep going up at the same size over the years but we still want to keep going left right which is make it smaller and smaller and still keep going up so you need to also rethink philosophy somewhere there yeah yeah thanks uh that was a great question and answer and also uh, i do have another question so with your 2023 uh, version of your uh, drone what is its operation hour you mean flight time yeah uh the flight i think with all of wait was about 7 minutes which is terrible um Right now we are at about one fifth the no one eighth the size and we have about eighteen minutes of flight time. Eighteen minutes of flight time. One eight one eight in the smallest robot you saw that's about eighteen minutes of flight time. Oh, yep. nice. Again, remember that we are all using uh, off-the-shelf components, right? Which we can buy if you are like a company like DJI or Skydio, which builds its own motors in house. We can optimize that a lot more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, and. Uh... Yeah, I uh, I see that we are at six uh, thirty uh, six. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, thanks for a great talk. It's been wonderful. Uh, we all learned a lot today. Congratulations uh, on your accepted paper.
And uh, yeah, we look forward uh, to see uh, how your research goes. Thanks again. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Have a good night. Bye.